Hey folks, let's take a closer look at neurophysiology. I thought since neurophysiology can be complex that we would sort of summarize what we've been through for this chapter. Let's start by taking a look at the neuron itself. So here we are, here's our neuron. Just your basic sketch of a neuron, but remember, a neuron at rest has a charge. And here's our charge. We can see that it's negative on the inside, positive on the outside, and that a neuron at rest has a charge of about negative 70 millivolts on the inside. So that's a neuron at rest not doing anything. But a neuron has lots of parts to it. So let's see if we can label some of the parts. Here we are, without the charges, we can see our dendrites that are bringing in information. And that information is going to be coming in along the dendrites in the form of graded potentials. We see we have our nucleus to control the cell. We have our very important axon hillock. The axon hillock is very important because that is where the action potential can be triggered to go down our axon. When the action potential makes it to the end of the axon, go down our telodendria, we hit these synaptic knobs. And in our synaptic knobs, we can see these synaptic vesicles that we just highlighted in blue. And these synaptic vesicles will be filled with neurotransmitter. But remember, this isn't all there is to our neuron. There are other cells associated with it to help us out. So let's add our charges back in and let's take a look at these other cells. So we have our charges added in and now we can see in green the neurolemocytes wrapping around that axon creating the myelin sheath. Now, if you recall, that myelin sheath is very important because it's going to help to speed up that action potential and insulate and protect our axon. So let's go ahead and remove our labels now and break our neuro neuron down into different parts. We see we have the segments here. We have the receptive segment. The receptive segment encompasses the cell body and the dendrites. Then we have the initial segment, and the initial segment is made up of that axon hillock because it initiates that action potential. Then we have the conductive segment, and the conductive segment is made up of the axon and those telodendria. And then lastly, we have those synaptic knobs, and that makes up the transmissive segment. So we have our receptive segment here in yellow. We have our initial segment, that axon hillock in blue. We have our conductive segment which is our axon and axon hillock. And then we have at the very end, we have our transmissive segment, the synaptic knobs. So why are each of these segments different? They're different because of their functions. And their functions are different because each of these segments has separate, different channels. In the receptive segment, we have some really interesting chemically gated channels. So if you look in green, 
we have our, and I'll go ahead and underline that, we have our chemically gated cation channels. And then up here we see some chemically gated chloride channels. And I've drawn them in in green and blue. So these are chemically gated channels, meaning that in order for them to open, we have to have a chemical key. And that chemical is most likely going to be a neurotransmitter. In the initial segment, we start to see a different type of channel. Here in red, I have sketched voltage-gated sodium channels. And I'll highlight those for you, right here and here. You can see that they continue down into the conductive segment as well. And these are voltage-gated, meaning that to open them up, the charge changes. Then we also have voltage gated potassium channels. So we can see those here starting at the axon hillock and going all the way down our axon. And those are voltage gated potassium. So they're voltage gated again meaning that a voltage change will trigger them to open. Now we can't forget that when we get down to that transmissive segment, we also start to see another type of channel. And here we have voltage-gated calcium channels. So those are our channels. In order to make sense of these channels, we need to realize where our ions are initially located in a neuron at rest. So if we take a look at a neuron, say here's our neuron at rest with our negative charge on the inside, positive charge on the outside, at negative 70 millivolts. Now as you recall, ions cannot get across the membrane all on their own. We need channels. And that's where those channels we were talking about come into play. So let's go ahead and make ourselves some of these channels. So let's go ahead and put holes in our membrane. so that we can make some channels. Now let's start with where our ions are typically located. So sodium, for example. Most of the sodium is located outside of our neuron. That's where most of the sodium is. Potassium, on the other hand, is mostly located on the inside. Chloride ions, mostly located on the outside. And generic anions, negatively charged, are located on the inside. And lastly, more calcium is located outside. So this is what our starting point is. So if we did go ahead and make some channels, maybe we have a chloride channel or a sodium channel. So if, let's say we made a chloride channel or a sodium channel or a potassium channel. Let's start with sodium. Which way would sodium move? Sodium is going to diffuse into our cell. 
the question is why? Well, we got two big reasons. Concentration is going down its concentration gradient and charge. It's attracted to the negative charge inside. So concentration and charge. These are the two things to consider whenever you're asking which way will an ion move. Sodium is going to move in. Potassium, on the other hand, is going to be moving out. What about things like calcium or chloride ions? Well, calcium and chloride ions will both be moving in. So, to summarize, sodium is going to be diffusing in, potassium will diffuse out. Chloride will come in, and so can calcium. So with that information, we can now go back to our neuron and start using these really cool channels. So here's our neuron again. But now that we see that a neuron is not alone, and in fact, if you look on the left, we now see a synaptic knob synapsing with our dendrite. And that synaptic knob can send an action potential and possibly release neurotransmitter, which can then bind to those chemically gated channels on our neuron and get things going. But what's our neuron going to do with all this information? Well, it could communicate with another neuron. So now on the far right, we see our postsynaptic neuron in brown, or it might, it might synapse with another effector cell, like a muscle cell here in pink. But let's walk through the process from start to finish using another neuron. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Here we are all the way on the left, and an action potential has come down this teledendria into the synaptic knob. And that's going to trigger this to release neurotransmitter, which will diffuse across the cleft and bind to our chemically gated cation channel. That's going to open this channel, and what we're going to see is a lot of sodium coming in. Sure, some potassium will leave, but mostly sodium is coming in. That sodium is coming in is going to cause a depolarization event. Turning the inside slightly positive. And that sodium will diffuse. This is our EPS excitatory postsynaptic potential. We are exciting this neuron in its receptive segment. Now if enough sodium comes in and diffuses to the axon illic right about here, if we hit that magic number threshold which is negative 55 millivolts, if we hit that then we trigger an action potential. An action potential started here by opening up these voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium is going to flood in, diffusing to the next node, the next node of Ranvier or neurofibril node, opening up our next set of voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium will come in, zip down, diffuse to the next node by saltatory conduction, and then diffuse, opening up each of these channels as it goes down the teledendria into the synaptic knobs. All along we're changing that voltage 
all the way up to positive 30, depolarizing our axon. Once this action potential reaches our synaptic knobs, then we open up our voltage-gated calcium channels. And opening up those channels is going to allow calcium to enter our cell. And calcium is going to interact with these synaptic vesicles filled with neurotransmitter. So let's go ahead and put some neurotransmitter in there. There we go. And now the neurotransmitter will be released into the synaptic cleft where it's going to bind with receptors located on the receptive segment of that postsynaptic neuron. But right behind all of this sodium diffusing in, once we hit that positive 30 millivolts, that's when potassium diffuses out. So right behind us, potassium is exiting. Potassium is exiting right behind that sodium. And what that's going to do is repolarize our cell, taking us back down to negative 70. And then some, because remember, we overshoot. And the potassium channels are going to close when we're hyperpolarized. So that brings us back to our starting resting membrane potential. So here we have our neuron. It looks kind of messy now. But this is our neuron from start to finish, our great story of how we get our graded potentials, this EPSP. Remember, that is our graded potential. which triggers at the initial segment at the axon hillock our action potential, the sodium channels opening followed by the potassium channels opening all the way down till we open up our calcium channels all the way at the synaptic knobs, triggering the release of neurotransmitter to diffuse across the cleft to our postsynaptic cell.